Hi, and welcome to the special AA How It Works Saturday Night Live Speaker Participation Meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Brian and I am an alcoholic. Hi, Brian. Please take a moment to turn off your cell phones and if you'd like a cup of coffee or some food, please grab one during, in the kitchen or on the table back there at any time during the meeting. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. It is a custom in Southern California to read a portion of Chapter 5 labeled How It Works in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and tonight we have asked Sherry to read this for us. How It Works. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program, usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living, which demands rigorously rigorous honesty. honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose, in a general way, what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. At some of these, we balked. We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all of the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us. But there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. Half measures have availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. 12, having had a spiritual awakening. As the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Many of us exclaimed, what an order. I can't go through with it. Do not be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saints. The point is that we are willing to grow along spiritual lines the principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. 
our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. And C, that God could and would if he were sought. Thank you. Um, our special format for this meeting is for each of our speakers to share for 15 minutes. Commencing on steps one, two, and three, please welcome our first speaker tonight, Alan. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Alan, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, um, Yeah. So I guess I should think of something to say. <laughs> so I think uh, the, the point about getting to the first three steps for me, you know, took a while because I first had to get like into AA and then go to some meetings and then hear the steps repeated and repeated. And, um, and then eventually, you know, try and figure out, you know, whether or not I wanted anything to do with that. I, I don't know what happened to you guys, but, you know, I kind of, I kind of came to in an office in front of a bunch of people with my boss sitting in there. And I was yelling at him, you know, about all the resources he wasn't giving me and how I couldn't continue to do my job without getting what it was I needed. And, and I just, I heard somebody call it like blacking in, you know? <laughs> That's what happened to me. I blacked in in this office and I was just yelling at these people. And I, was, and I was busted. I knew it inside. I knew they knew. I mean, I figured, you know, they could smell it probably always, but, you know, there's a difference between smelling it and then somebody actually coming up to you and saying, like, you stink like alcohol all the time, and I think you might have a drinking problem, you know? But when you're in the office yelling at them all, and stinking of booze because you are currently drunk. So I knew I needed to do something about that. And right around the same time, you know, I had a bunch of the employees were calling up and saying they were going to quit because this isn't what they signed up for, like having a crazy lunatic boss that yells at them all the time and and I couldn't lose them. And at that same time, you know, my wife wanted to get a divorce for some unknown reason. <laughs> so I knew I had to get them all off my back. And so I, I heard somewhere that if you admit to having a drinking problem, like they can't fire you, whoever they are. I don't even know if that's a real law, but I had it in my head that that was the truth. So I felt like I needed to make some big dramatic statement. So I told my boss, you know, I have a drinking problem and I'm going to get it under control. And I thought that was the best preemptive strike I could make before getting fired. And then I told my wife the same thing because it worked so well on my boss. <laughs> and so... She had me in this detox facility like the next day. <laughs> she had a friend who had a friend and she worked there or something at a conference. And so there I was, you know, with all these losers. <laughs> and I was just sitting on the grass, the like astro turf grass. And I would hang out at this, like, picnic bench thing that was there between the, like, modular housing things that we all slept in. And I didn't really want to talk to anybody. And a guy handed me, like, a little big book. 
And so primarily because I didn't want to talk to any of those people, I just kind of read it and smoked and drank decaf coffee. And in it, I, I, I related to a lot of what was being said in there. And so I knew that when I went back to work after seven days, that I couldn't keep my scam going unless I went to AA meetings and then did what I would imagine people would do if they went to AA meetings and complained about them. <laughs> and so I'd go to this meeting and I'd go at lunch so everybody knew that I was going to my AA meeting and I just couldn't take it. But I knew a guy in AA and his name's Chick and I just started calling him. And to them, I would kind of front like, now nah, I got to go to my stupid AA meeting. I'll see you guys later. And then while I was in there, you know, I, nobody there was all that impressed that I was in there. And I felt like, I felt like they should be. And then when they walk up to me and talk to me, I didn't want them to talk to me. But then if they didn't talk to me, I'd get really annoyed that they weren't talking to me. And so I was in a bind because at the same time, you know, I, I was just miserable and everything had just fallen apart or was on the verge of falling apart. Nothing was really getting any better. And so I was calling my friend Chick, you know. And Chick's telling me I should do the steps. And I'd heard the steps a bunch, you know. And what they said was, admit was I was an alcoholic and believe in God. That's what, that's how they read to me. That's what I would hear when people would say him, you know. And I didn't believe in God. And an alcoholic, you know, I had my own definition of what an alcoholic was. And me and my friends used to joke about it when we drank, you know. We were all alcoholics, we knew that. Like. We were addicted to alcohol, whatever that meant. We liked drinking. That's what that meant. And so armed with my own definition of what an alcoholic was, it wasn't, you know, whatever it was in the AA rooms. And then, you know, this one time I was standing outside of an AA meeting smoking, and, and this guy came up to me, this like new guy who everybody in the meeting was always making fun of for going out all the time. And, and, uh, and, and he asked me, you know, like, oh, how do you even know if you're an alcoholic? And being the know-it-all that I am, it was odd for me to admit, internally, of course, that I... <laughs> I don't have any idea. How would you know that, you know? And so I, I commenced to reading the book again. This time almost like as a study guide, you know? And, and then when I came to this beginning part of the book that says, you know, we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. And this is the first step in recovery. And I thought, that's not the first step in recovery. They read chapter five every day. The first step in recovery is that we admitted that we were alcoholic and our lives had become unmanageable. So how can there be two first steps? <laughs> so... <laughs> So I was kind of posed with like, ah, oh, scam, you know. I, I can either just not do any of them. But I don't know. Like these, you know, these guys keep saying that it'll get better, you know, whatever it. How to, I don't know how they know what it is, but it sucks and it needs to get better. And, um, and so I read, I, I came up with this plan and I ran it by Chick. I'm like, I'm going to read in the big book. And I'm going to come up with every single place where it talks about alcoholics and alcoholism. And I'm going to write down what it says. And then I'm going to read in the Merriam-Webster's Merriam Dictionary about what an alcoholic is. And I'm going to write those things down. And then I'm going to see if I'm that. 
So all of a sudden, I had this list of what an alcoholic is, and so much of it, oddly, was not about drinking. Some, a lot of it was about drinking, and a lot of it wasn't, you know? Some of it was just about being a tornado that, like, rips through the lives of others, you know? And then, and then other components of it was just, like, you know, this, like, this, like, feeling that I have to dominate everybody or, or that when I'm not getting my way, I can be, like, really nice or if that doesn't work, I can be, like, really mean. Or if that doesn't work, I can just double down on each of them until, you know, eventually I slap everybody around enough to doing what I want them to do. And that, and that there's a selfishness and a self-centeredness in there. And, and when I read through that list, you know, and, and then I had other problems too, like what is innermost? <laughs> like none of the words like meant anything to me, you know? Because I don't think I was ever really in the business of looking at myself. I was in the business of deflecting. And uh, somehow I was able to sit down and read through this list of, this descriptive list of things. And then what I did was, I, you know, I wanted to thoroughly follow their path, you know? Which to those guys meant like, discovering what all of this meant, writing an entire book about it, building an entire society around it. I mean, I don't know that I'm willing to go to their lengths, but I could write some stuff down. So I, I took the definitions that I had and the words that they used, and I rewrote the steps using the definitions that I came up with. The step, the step one, what I call the pre-step, and then I did it again with step one, you know. And I thought about step one, what, you know, how, that I'm powerless over alcohol and try to figure out what that means, you know. What does, how, do you, how is one powerless over an inanimate object, you know? It, for me, I decided I was powerless over everything, like the way I think about it, the way the bottles look, like still look interesting to me. Interesting. <laughs> you know, the, the kind of aura around it, the fake ass person that I became trying to pretend like I could handle it, all of it, you know. The fact that I think that it can solve a problem, <laughs> those are the things I'm powerless against, you know. And my unmanageable life is uh, like, well, I mean, I think I described it to you. Just yelling at bosses and getting divorced and, and uh, you know, losing all my employees. Once I realized that an alcoholic was not some disease that I had, but rather the actual person that I am. I admitted that I was an alcoholic, not that I had alcoholism. And that that is now not something that can be removed from me by me, right? It seems obvious. I only have two minutes left. <laughs> seems obvious that since I can't remove a fundamental component of myself, that the only possible way it could be is by some other power, some power that's not me, some power that's assumably greater than me. <laughs> and then, but now I'm screwed, right? Now I just have this horror, but I'm just this thing. I'm just this creature, basically, from what my descriptions read. And only a power greater than me can remove it. And I don't have that power, you know. I don't know what that power is. So I continue to talk to Chick, who now has become my formal sponsor. <laughs> and, um, and we went about a process of trying to define what, what um, God is, right? I, because now I have to... I get it, there's a power greater than me, but now I have to turn my will and my life over to the care of God <laughs> as I understand him, right? So what we eventually came up with was like, 
this ideal set, this ideal me, you know? And within a given situation, the idea is that when I'm feeling frustrated, when I'm feeling scared, and when I'm feeling panicked, I could turn my thoughts over to what that guy would do in this situation, how that guy would be in this situation. How could he handle it? I know he could handle it better than me. And then I just copy what he would do. And that in and of itself has brought me like so much relief that I can't thank Chick enough. I can't thank the people in these rooms enough. Really, all, all I can do is just show up. And if anybody else is having any struggles with any of this shit, sorry. You know, try and just let them know what happened to me and how easy it really can be to go from being just the wreck that I was to being in an entirely much more sustainable life now. And, uh, you know, I don't know, some magic that happens in here. I appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. And, uh, steps four, five, and six. Please welcome our second delightful speaker of tonight, Nancy. My name is Nancy, and I am an alcoholic. Hi, Nancy. Brian, thank you, very, thank you very much for asking me to speak tonight. I could be home watching the SC football game. SC is ahead, or at least they were at the end of the second quarter for all of you non-blue and gold fans. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I have step four, five, and six, and uh, what you'll hear hopefully is, has been my experience, and of course it's colored by lots of things, by my, my actual experience, by what I've heard from other people, uh, what I've seen other people do. Um, my, when I was ready for the fourth step, I probably had um, close to two years of sobriety. And my sponsor sat down with me, and she gave me very, very specific directions. And she told me to write on the top of the page, God, please keep me honest. Please keep me honest. Please keep me honest. And... Um, the fourth step is about a house cleaning. Now, I am a tad OCD, and so, uh, just a tad, uh, yeah. Um, and so I know about house cleaning, and as soon as I was supposed to start writing my fourth step, my house has never literally been as clean as it was prior to that time, and since then. Because what would happen is I would go to write, and I, she made me promise that I would, um, I actually wrote it in a journal, and she said, you have to work on it every single day. Okay, so that was the assignment. And I'd come home, and, oh, this drawer needs cleaning. Oh, that cabinet needs cleaning. So the house got really, really clean, but my fourth step didn't get written at all. And so she, you know, gently and sometimes not so gently asked me how it was coming, and I said, well... And so she, made, she then said, at least open your big book and open whatever you're writing on. And so I would get home before my husband, every day at that particular point in time. And I would lay down on the bed, not a good idea, <laughs> and open up the book, 
the big book so that I could see the directions. I did follow as it is written with the columns and I would open up my journal and I would promptly fall asleep. Okay, I opened my journal. Okay, we're good to go. You know what, I woke up, I just closed the journal, hadn't written a thing, closed my big book, went on probably to a meeting. Anyhow, that I don't, I have not a clue how long that went on. I, when I sat in the rooms the first couple of years, I would read the steps and and people would say, oh, I'm so afraid of doing the four step, but I was so out of touch with any kind of reality, any kind of feelings, any, any of that stuff, that I didn't, I said, oh, what's the problem with doing that? You know, clearly, you know, the house got cleaned, but the, you know, the, the inventory didn't get written. Well, eventually, if you do something long enough, you get sort of tired of having that crease in your face because you're sleeping on the book, and it's got drool on one side, and yeah, it was just messy. And so I did eventually write it, and once I started, I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote. And I would give myself, though, it, once I did start, I didn't just write continuously. It was a period of time, and it's... You know, since that major first one was done, it's been a lot of years, so I don't remember. But it was quite a long period of time, and it was really, and I was still, yeah, I had some time. I'd been to lots of meetings, went to book studies, uh, which I still do. I love book studies. I love step studies, and actually, I am going through the big book with one of my sponsees right now, and... Truly, every time I open that book and read it, I see something different. That book, where I am in my life, that's what speaks to me at that particular point in time. So it's always, always changing. And I have my 12 and 12 here. It took me about, oh, I would guess somewhere close to 15 years before I understood what this book actually said. I would read it and I'd get to the next paragraph and I didn't know what the paragraph ahead of it said. Don't know why that was true. It is my experience. If any of out there are having trouble, my hat is off to you. That was my, that was just my journey. You know, I really, really, really struggled with it. But, so, it was just so hard to, okay, resentments. No, I don't resent anybody. Well, once I started writing, la da 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 da, you know, and it was it was uh, as thorough at that time as I possibly could have made it. Was it perfect? No, of course not. And as time has gone on, I have done redone four steps, um, and each time they talk about the onion being peeled. Certainly that has been my experience. I have, um, as I have stuck around and become more willing to turn my life and my will over to care of God, however any of you or how I define God, and my God changes all the time, um, just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger until there's, I have no... You know, no words. I have absolutely zero words to describe my higher power. Um, but I also, but part of that was faith. Okay, my sponsor told me, you do this, you'll feel better. And this is how we, you know, this is how we do it. And so I did do it. Um, and I began, as I was writing, I was beginning to see the same words coming out over and over and over. And it was like, ooh, this looks like a pattern. And it was, you know, and that wasn't very surprising. And then I called my sponsor and I said, okay, it's all written. When can we get together so I can read it? So we're on to the fifth step. Because for me, Writing something and saying I'm sharing it with God is one thing. Telling it to another human being 
it keeps me a lot more on my toes. And that first thing that she told me to do is write about honest, you know, to keep it honest. Well, reading it to her was keeping it honest. So we get, I go over to her place and we're sitting on the couch and I'm reading away and I, you know, I'm mortified by certain things that I've done and all this stuff and I look over and she is sound asleep. <laughs> so I sort of sit there and she wakes up and then I start reading again and a couple hours go by. She sound asleep again. Went on for two days, but eventually it got read. You know? And she took notes. You know, she took notes. And, and after the second day, we did do step six. And, you know, step six is like one little tiny paragraph. And um, as I was thinking about today, and after I read it in the big, in the 12 and 12, and it's like, okay, got it, sort of. Um, what I realized how I practice step six today more than um, became entirely willing. I've never been entirely anything, you know? And so, yeah, I hold on to things and then I get new lessons, you know? And if I don't let it go a little bit more, I'll get more lessons. And sometimes I get just sick and tired of having these lessons because after a while, it's just like in the, in the fifth step, they're the same things over and over again. The person's face may change, the surroundings may change, but it's me, you know, it's me back there again doing the same crazy stuff over again and expecting different results. So one of the things I do the very, very first thing I do when I wake up is I pray for God's will and the power to carry that out. It is the very, very first thought that comes into my mind. And that helps me get centered. I also um, go to an 11th step meeting, which I absolutely love. And so prayer, meditation, and writing are all part of my, sort of my morning ritual. That too gets me centered and able to, you know, face, face a new day. Now, do I take my will back, you know, as am I willing to do this today? And some days it's like, nee, don't think so. You know, and that happens. You know, there are days that I can throw a tantrum, you know, when I, I will look back and I go, I'm like this two-year-old, arms flailing, jumping up and down, and it's like, that's embarrassing. You know, I am not young <laughs> at all. I'm a great-grandmother, so, you know, should I really be acting uh, like one of my great-grandkids? I don't think so, you know, and that's part of the, the forgiveness in the program and that room we have to grow, and that's what the, for me, that's the fourth, fifth, and the sixth step. It's for me to grow, for me to know more who Nancy is, and to turn those things that get me into trouble, but that are troublesome to me. When I walk around with whatever resentment it is, I'm the one carrying the burden. You know, I love the, the saying that, you know, having a resentment is like drinking the poison and expecting the other person to die. You know, and that's, that has really, really, really been my, my truth. I will say that, oh, maybe 10 years ago, yeah, about 10 years ago, I guess, I decided that something my spouse had done was really wrong, and I was not going to forgive him. So that was a very specific, I will not, I don't care what the steps say, I don't care about anything. I'm right. You know, that righteous, that righteous anger that the fourth step really, really talks about. And so I held on to that anger to the point where I could not move my arms above my waist. And they tried to diagnose me with MS because I was paralyzed, literally paralyzed. So it was a wonderful... Um, lesson 
in what happens if I sit on this, you know, if I sit on those, that anger, if I sit on those resentments, it does come back. It may not be as blatant or as quite as physical as that one was, but it comes back. And I don't need to live that way anymore. I don't have to be right. I want to live in peace. I want to live in serenity. And I get to do that by doing a fourth step, doing a fifth step, doing a tenth step, which I'm glad I'm not speaking about it because I still struggle with the tenth step. But it, I am better today than when I walked in the rooms. I am better today than I was a week ago. I'm present, you know, and that's one of the huge, huge, huge blessings of this program. The desire to drink and use was removed right away, actually before I walked into the rooms, and that was, it, it was such a blessing, and I was so grateful for it, but it was also one of those things that, oh, I'm better than them because look at me. You know, that's part of what the fourth and the fifth step do. Get me right-sized. I have to be reminded to be right-sized. I have this belief that, that uh, one of the mutations of my, my higher power is all, and we are all part of all. And I can't define all, but I'm just a little... I'm as important as everybody else, but we're all just little tiny pieces in this. Um, we can call it a tapestry, we can call it a, a beach or the stars or whatever. We're just all together. And when I'm equal with everybody else in my own heart and in my own mind, then I'm at peace. And um, being at peace is something that I truly, truly enjoy. I love being sober. I'm so grateful to be here. Brian, thank you again. Alcoholics Anonymous has changed my entire life and actually the life of my entire family. So I am grateful. Thank you. This meeting has been here for more than 30 years. We had this idea to do these um, these, these four speakers and we put it before a group conscious and I don't know if you guys have ever been to a GSR meeting but, but we got a unanimous consent to go forward with this and that's remarkable and I can't tell you the joy that this meeting has brought me tonight. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here and supporting this spectacular meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you Robin. Oh it's anonymous it's like phenomenal man you know um i'm lucky okay i'm gonna tell you why i'm lucky okay because i'm sharing on seven eight nine and i met god a long time ago i met god when i was 12. the reason why i met god when i was 12 because i got shot six different times not the same time different times okay i got shot with everything and um i have a straight razor cut had my eye in my hand when I was 12. And I can tell you that when those things happened, God just put a blanket around me and told me everything was gonna be okay. So I met God a long time ago, so I had never had a problem with God. And then I had my mother too, and she was very spiritual. Very, very spiritual. She. I come from a large family, so uh, I had three sisters, and then there's seven boys, and I'm the middle boy, okay? And um, my older brothers were just thugs, and my mother, she looked at me, and between her and my father, it's like, we're going to protect him, because he looked like he got sense, so. Because <laughs> my brothers were crazy, I'm telling you, you know, so. Anyway, um... My mother, you know, instilled me with certain spiritualities that I found again when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. You guys use a term like hang with the winners, right? You know, when you first get sober. This is what my mother told me when I was like nine or ten. 
She says, there are only four people in the world, just four. People that add, subtract, multiply, and divide from their true blessings from God. And if you choose to put a person in your life, which is in your heart, you must give them a mathematical equation. So okay. So she would see me hanging out with somebody like Harold Boy, and she'd call me and says, what's his mathematical equation to you? Because this guy was a troublemaker in the neighborhood. And I would look at him and say, well, well he damn sure don't add, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And so forth, and then she would make me tell the truth. You know, it's like, hey, what you doing? So what, why are you with them? And then I said, okay. Huh. So I wanted to set it up like that because I am a step junkie. Trust me on that. You know, I have no, I have written a 10th step for 25 years, and I don't miss no days. I might miss three, four days in a year. I always wanted to know about me. You know what I mean? I was, I was, I was possessed with that. And uh, <clears throat> when I finally put this list together for this, you know, to turn my creator, I'm now willing you should have all of me, the good and the bad. I pray that you blah, 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 blah. And I looked at this list and it's like, oh, hell, I love doing that. And I definitely don't want to stop doing this, and I definitely don't want to stop doing that. But then it came to me, you know. When I first got sober, I got many blessings, you know. One of my blessings was, without me even knowing it, uh, after losing my mother, my sobriety date is my mother's birthday. And I know that that was her, like, okay, I was on it, you know. So I made a deal with God. Early in sobriety, I think I had a week. And my deal was, I don't want to do pretty much any of this stuff, okay? But if you help me get this giant gorilla off my back and so forth, I promise you that I will always pray for the willingness to do what I'm supposed to do. And that's a major thing for me. Anytime I don't want to do something, I pray for the willingness. Okay? My mother used to tell me when I was younger that, you know, two things about, you, about me. And she said, the first thing is that you are all or nothing person. You know, she's, I don't know why you like that, but either you're going to do something or you ain't going to goddamn do it, you know. And the other thing that I'm really blessed from, because I know a lot of alcoholics go through this. My mother told me that I just don't give a rat's ass about what anybody thinks about me. And I don't, you know, and I ain't talking about pretending to. I just don't. You know, it was, it was, it's a little story real quick. It was a bunch of boys in my family, so I was a middle boy, so I never got new clothes. You know, it's, it's like when I'm going to school, my older brothers would get clothes, and I would get their hand downs, and then my younger brothers would get my clothes. And I remember this one sweater my brother had all year, you know, we was in high school. But I loved that sweater. He would never let me wear it. And then... The next year came, and it was my sweater, okay? And I got that sweater, and I put it on, and uh, my brother and my mother said, yeah, but I've been wearing it all year. I don't care. It's my sweater. I don't care what nobody say, you know, about you wearing it. So I, was, I just didn't care. And that's a blessing, because when I came in Alcoholics Anonymous, I remember being in rehab, and we sit around in this circle, and people were talking about, you know, they didn't fit in, and it was less than, I was trying to figure out what the hell are they talking about, you know? Who cares, you know? <laughs> I, didn't know I didn't get it, I didn't get it, you know? So, anyway, uh, I wrote a little stuff down. I'm a book person, so. Um, I, I had to pray for the willingness to give this stuff to God, okay? 
from where I'm from, North New Jersey, and from me, I never ever wanted to act spiritual because it wasn't a thing to do. That's why my ass got shot all the time. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can't walk around being a good guy. You know what I mean? So, so I had to pray for the willingness to give up a lot of different stuff that was accustomed to me, and I had to. Pray for the willingness, and then when I go into the book, it tells me, okay, why am I doing this? Well, I went to page 77, and it says, our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. Wow, that means it ain't about me. Wow, that means that my life, if I truly made that decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God, it's God's life. It ain't mine no more. I'm supposed to fit myself to be a maximum service to God and the people about us. I said, okay, that's what I have to do. Um, I've been of service in a lot of different things. I remember going back to the rehab for over a year and a half every day. He thought I was in it, you know just helping out people. But I was so into this and I was trying to learn everything that I needed to learn about myself through this book. This book is like, wow, it's like it has everything in it. You guys ever read, read this book? You know, it's got all of this different stuff in it. Then I had to, you know, uh, make a list and, you know, what does it say? Make a list of all the people here at harm and, be, and become willing to uh, make amends or whatever it says. Let me see. I want to be exact when I say this. Um, so what I did was, it says, made a list of persons we had harm and became willing to make amends to them all. So when I made my list, okay, the key word in that whole thing was become willing, okay? Willing to make amends. So I had to list the people, places and things, and then I characterized them. I need to talk to this one first, that one, that one, that one, that one, when I'm making these amends, okay? So, and it told me on page 83 that don't get all spiritual and this and that because people don't want to hear that. You know, your actions will speak better than your words. And that's true, you know, because they've been looking at me drunk and high for years. They don't want to hear nothing what I'm talking about. They want to see what I'm doing. So when I started out to make my amends, my mother's head was in me and said, you can't lie about this, okay? You have to really do this in honesty. Now, can't tell a person like me that because I'm rigorous, you know? So I will tell you, ain't no way in hell that I'm gonna apologize for anything I did to you because I meant to do that shit, you know? <laughs> I meant to steal the money from your purse. I needed that. I needed to get high. I meant to do this and that. What, I, what it is that I have to say is that I was wrong for doing those things. But if you think, I, you know, I'm apologizing for, oh, hell no. That's how I got to where I am today from doing that. So you know what that was like with my wife. He's sitting there with a box of popcorn, getting ready to, you know, like, you have a mens. Said, listen here, I'm going to tell you, you know, I couldn't wait to steal out of your purse to go get me a bottle, short dog, or whatever. And you knew I was going to do it anyway. That's why you left money in there. Yeah, you ain't stupid. You know? <laughs> just so you could be on the right side of stuff, you know? <laughs> so I already knew that, you know? So I was like, 
I went and I started making my amends. And I was taught, you know, for me, it's, 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 it, it's about action, okay, and not that. And I remember this one guy, a really, really good friend of mine. I used to juke him out a hundred dollars here, this and that and that. And you know, and like he really cared about me. And now I'm in the music industry and I ran China Club for years. And we used to always have to, well, we didn't have to, but we would go to breakfast after we would close up. It'd be like three, four o'clock in the morning. And I remember this guy, I would, I, he's the only one I never made the amends to. Never made the amends to. <laughs> More, more or less, I was more ashamed. I didn't want to do it and so forth. And by the way, if there's a person you can't get to and make amends to, and you don't do it, you ain't on nine. You back on eight because you become willing to do that, you know. So anyway, we, we had breakfast, and my wife had wanted me to pick up some uh, coffee made. And I went to the Rouse and the Marina. It was open 24 hours. And I swear to God, this, this is how God works with me. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. The only people in the store are the people who stack in the shelves. And I turn down the aisle with a cart. And who's there? It's him. Ain't nobody else in this store but me and him. He's coming this way, and I'm going that way. I can't duck him. You know what I mean? And I said, oh, my God. And I just looked up in there and says, okay, you know. I, did, I, I, I didn't get to the point of being willing, so God said, I'm going to help you out here, you know. <laughs> you know this is what's going to happen. You're going to make this amends so you can get on with your life. And I did. And, you know, and this program has been like that for me from the very beginning. I just get blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed by God, and I got blessed by God a long time ago. I just never wanted him to run my life, you know? But then, hey, you know, you get to a certain point where you just can't be stupid all the time, you know? <laughs> That's what my mother used to tell me. Oh, you just can't be stupid all the time, you know? You gotta do the right thing. Thank you for letting me share. And our final speaker commenting on steps 10, 11, and 12, please welcome my good friend, Kevin. Good evening, ladies and gents. I'm Kevin, alcoholic. Thank you, Brian, for asking me this AA request you never say no to. It saved my life more times than once. And I want to thank all of everybody that is here tonight because you folks are 12-stepping me because it'd be rather foolish right now to be standing in, in an empty room right now. I'd be stuck listening to me talk, but at least I got you to listen to. Hey, or hear me. Right now I'm talking about step 10, 11, and 12. 10, 11, and 12. And for me, those are three of the four action steps in our program, the ninth being the first action step. And you know, there's a saying in the big book, faith without action is dead. And I have to say that it's been mentioned before that, you know, going to meetings and going to step studies and book studies, you know, as time goes by, you know, that proverbial layer of onion gets peeled back. And as mentioned before, many times as I read this book, time and time again, when I'm desperate, I become willing and my ears and my eyes magically open up and I see something new and different in this book. So step 10 is continue to take personal inventory, and we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Real quick, about a decade ago, apparently I was really restless, irritable, and discontent. I had been working the steps, I was doing service work, I was going to meetings, but I was still restless, irritable, and discontent. I was enraged inside and out. Didn't know it. Until one day I heard a gentleman share about step 10, and apparently I was hearing what he was having, having to say, and it resonated with me. So I looked at this, I refer to the 12 and 12 tonight, plus my opinions on these steps. And so I looked up step 10 in the 12 and 12, and I said, I better get to, get to work. 
So the first place I actually used this step was at work, and I have a very small staff. And in a matter of a couple, two, three weeks, I had made amends to those staff members more than once. And by the second, third week, I had some of those same staff members ask me if I was on medication. <laughs> Am I on Prozac? And the reason being is that they saw such a difference, light and day, that instead of being intolerant, impatient, angry, and just not willing to listen what you had to say, or even look at you with any kind of kindness and compassion, I'd become just a rage. And when I started to listen to or apologize to these folks, they thought it like something was wrong with me. But then things started turning around. And as a direct result of working this step, I gained the art, the skill of listening to what the possibilities may be. See, because I become a why person, and I chose to become a why not person. Maybe something that you want to share with me has some validity. Let's find the compromise. Let's get some unity in this office rather than division. So as a step 10 in the 12 and 12 talks about, you know, it talks about the jealousy, the envy, the self-pity, the hurt pride, the silent scorn or the sulking that might result of a relationship to, with another human being. And it's not necessarily what I say or what I do, but it may be how I say it or how I do something. Or if nothing else, it's my intent. You know, it's like, you know, I may say, hey, you did a good job when I really think you did crap. It's just to butter you up for something other crap that I may assign you. Well, folks, when I read this book again in my 12 and 12 step study, a light hit. Because all of a sudden, the sentences that I have read over and over again slapped me in the face. Because for over 15 years, you know, I was really like in my fifth column in my fourth step, my part in it all the time. And then when I read in this chapter, it says right here, it's a continuous look at our assets and liabilities. Here we cast up, up a balance sheet crediting ourselves with things well done. See, I go to bed at night and I go through the day and I ask myself, did I have to make any amends? And if I do, I probably list them in my brain and do them the next day. But what about putting myself on the amends list? That angst, that anger, that envy, that pride, that stomach churning, the shoulders coming up around my ears, that anger, put myself on that amends list. There's a saying in this program about take it easy. For me, that's in the 10th step. It has given me permission, not just to put myself on the amends list for my behavior, but how about put myself on that list on the black side, not just the red side of the ledger. And it says here, this is a good place to remember that inventory taking is not always done in red ink. Now, we're just like a little pet. We like to be patted, given acknowledgement. But I have no expectations that you folks are going to give me any acknowledgement. But what I can do at the end of my day, after I go through my inventory and ask myself how I treated my other human beings, I can also put it on that list and ask that question, how good was I? And pat myself on the back and say, job well done. It's progress, folks. You know, there's a saying that we are our own harshest critic. Lighten up. And one of the things that, you know, I got tired of doing step 10. I kept having to make amends wherever I went. 
So there's a saying, <laughs> you know, and that's really part of step 12, you know, but I, I'll get to that later. But you know what? I got tired of making amends, and it's because I self will run riot. Then there's a saying in the book, pause when agitated. Well, I don't know about you, but I pause when I'm bewildered. I'm paused when I don't give a damn. I pause when I know I don't know, rather than give BS. I pause before I exaggerate or start telling stories. That pause, like right now, leads me to the 11th step, that prayer and meditation. That pause, as prayer is me asking God for the willingness to do His will. But sometimes I ask for a desperation. Because for me, that's where I have to go to get willing. Let me see how desperate. I am so angry at myself. I'm so tightly wound. Please get me desperate enough to become willing to trust in you. But that meditation, just like right now, is just like that pause. Now, I don't practice meditation with um and the lotus position I'd break in three pieces. <laughs> but that 11th step in the 12 and 12. And let me read the 11th step. Saw through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. That's service work. That's being humble enough to be there for everybody else with no expectations. And as the 12 and 12 really highlights where I go, where I want to live, out of all the steps, the 11th step for me is where I want, it's my womb. And it talks about the St. Francis prayer. To me, as it says in this book, it's about self-forgetting. I'm not here as much as I want to impact your lives by something that I say tonight. I told earlier that you folks were 12-stepping me. I get to hear myself talk about how I apply these steps in my life. It's a reminder to me that I want to self-forget on a daily basis. When I'm forgetting myself, I don't need to like make amends on a daily basis because I'm here for you. You know, in meditation and in that moment of silence, you know, you may have a conversation with my, your higher power. And in here it does mention that there is a possibility that that little conversation that you may think is straight with God and the plan that gets devised from that may not be God. It may be your voice talking to you. And that's where you really have to pray and actually pause again and say, ask myself, is this the next indicated action? Is this going to do well for everybody? Is it necessary? Is it righteous? St. Francis' prayer, it's better to forgive than to be forgiven. It's better to love than to be loved. I have to say that in this fellowship over the over the couple decades I've been part of this fellowship, the friends that I have treasure me for various reasons, and I can only say that I'm only a reflection of what has been given to me so freely and without ask by myself from you lovely ladies and gentlemen. And that's where step 12 comes in. I had a spiritual awakening. What would you think? As a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in our affairs. 
This kills me. I was desperate for 30 years to get buzzed. I've been in this program for the longest time. And when I read the first sentence of this step in the 12 and 12, I absolutely almost fell to the floor in the meeting. The joy of living is the theme of AA's 12 step and action is its key word. Not happy, are we happy? Do I have everything I want? Am I joyful that I'm alive and not dead where I was going before I walked into these rooms? The joy of living is the theme of this step. But then in the same paragraph, it talks about emotional sobriety. And I gotta tell you right now, that last sentence of the, the step, and to practice these principles in all our affairs, I have to say that I was, as it states in this book, it suggests that, and it, I'm talking about myself, I am that baby. If I don't get my way, I'm gonna wet my britches and have an attitude and squeal. I am not emotionally mature, I am not emotionally sober. And as a result, I couldn't practice these principles in all of my affairs or even carry the message to another alcoholic. Either I had to play God and dominate those about us, or we had insisted on being over-dependent on those individuals. Ladies and gentlemen, this 12-step has peeled back more layers of that onion. I'm not into recovery for alcohol and drugs like I was the first 12, 13 years. I need to be happy, joyous, and free. That's my new high. And I can't get there because I'm wrapped so tightly. And these steps have given me that freedom. Thank you for joining me down this road of happy destiny. I have asked Craig to read the 12 traditions while we pass the basket for this second round. Thank you. Yeah, hi, my name's Craig, I'm an alcoholic. Craig. We've got the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous here. Number one, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. And two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants, they do not govern. Three, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Four, each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Five, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic and still suffers. Six, an AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise. Less problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Seven, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Eight, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Nine, AA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. 10. Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. 11. Our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need to always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. And 12. Anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personality. <laughs> And now, after a moment of silent meditation for the alcoholic still suffering, both inside and outside these rooms, Teresa, would you lead us in the prayer of your choice? Our Father, our Father. 